Well, this morning we saw the safest place in the universe is uh, in the refuge of the embrace of Jesus Christ. Tonight, I'd like to do something just very exciting for you and kind of connect together all the New Testament portraits of what Jesus did in his earthly ministry with this incredible gallery of cities, each of which points to one of the facets of Christ's character. And by that, I mean the cities in Joshua 20. If you want to turn back there, this would be a night to uh, start using those little notepads that are in front of you in the pew racks, because this is something that could provoke you to a lot of further study. I just want to show you briefly an example of how the scripture points to Christ in the Old Testament. Just a small way, but the Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 10 that the scriptures are examples. The word example in 1 Corinthians 10, 11 is the Greek word tupas from which we get the English word types. He said that the Old Testament is filled with types. Now there's some people that get real narrow about this and they say there's about two or three of them but actually I believe that all of the Old Testament is speaking of Jesus Christ Jesus said that he said the scriptures they speak of me and he began with Moses went through the prophets and pointed that out since we didn't get to hear his sermon I just like to look at all of them and let me show you what I mean tonight in Joshua chapter 20 because once we get into the arms of Jesus what is it that we get once we feel his embrace, what is it that he does? Well, in Joshua 20, we note six truths, six beautiful truths for those who have fled to the safest spot in the universe. When you get there to him, you find that he is the perfect refuge, and he has so much to offer us. Jesus can be, for any and all of us, the perfect refuge. Jesus offers to each of us to be a refuge when we are unclean. That's what one of these cities talks about. Also a refuge when we are weary, a refuge when we are homeless, a refuge when we are helpless, a refuge when we are hopeless, and finally a refuge when we are tempted. I call this the wonderful benefits of staying in the safest spot in the universe. Well, I want to read Joshua 20 again, and you note six words as I read along here. And, starting in verse 7, they assigned Kadesh. That's the first word I'm going to look at with you this evening. In Galilee, in Mount Naphtali. And Shechem, that's the second word I'm going to look at with you, in Mount Ephraim. And Kiriath Arba, which is Hebron, that's the third of the cities of refuge, in the mountain of Judah. And on the other side of the Jordan, by Jericho eastward, they assigned Bezer. That's the fourth one we're going to look at in the wilderness upon the plain of the tribe of Reuben, and Ramoth, that's the fifth one, in Gilead, out of the tribe of Gad, and Golan, in Bashan, out of the tribe of Manasseh. These were the cities assigned for all the children of Israel, and for the stranger who sojourneth among them, that whosoever killeth any person without intent might flee, to the, avenger, might flee the avenger of blood until he stood before the congregation. Now let me go through those with you and tell you what each of those city names means. Kadesh, the first one, is not only a city name, it also means something. Remember, in, in the Hebrew language, that words had dual meanings. Like, do you remember Noah? Noah means comfort. Moses means drawn out. You can see that Noah was a comfort in that he delivered uh, the human race from extinction. Moses was drawn out of the river, and his whole life is drawing the children of Israel out of Egypt, and then finally drawing Egypt out of the children of Israel. Uh, m ones we know better are like uh, uh, Jacob means deceiver. And the Lord said to him when he was wrestling, he says, your name is Jacob, and that's what you are. You are a deceiver, a supplanter. Uh, if you remember Abigail, the, the wife of David, her husband that the Lord killed, his name was Nabal. And she said it. She said, my husband's just what his name is. And Nabal in Hebrew means a fool, uh, kind of a recalcitrant, hard-hearted fool. So in the Hebrew language, Hebrew words that are names like Kadesh and Ramoth and Bezer and Hebron are not only proper names, they also are Hebrew words that have a meaning to them. And so those are what I want to show you. And the first one, Kadesh, is not only a city name, but it also is the word that means holy place or righteousness, Kadesh. The whole idea of 
of holiness. And so this city, it's Kadesh, but when a Jewish person heard that, they heard holy place. Go to holy place. Go to the place of righteousness. Flee to the holy place or the place of righteousness when they would go to Kadesh. The second one, Shechem, which, by the way, is still a very hot city over there in in, um, Israel. It's where the Balat uh, refugee camp is uh, in the West Bank. Uh, But Shechem is not only a city name and still is, it also is the word for shoulder. So if if you were running for your life you'd say either i'm going to kadesh to righteousness or or the the place of, of holiness or i'm going to shechem i'm running to the shoulder now think of the implications of what would be in your mind you're running to the holy place the place of righteousness you're running to the shoulder i know that to a little person the shoulder is a very comforting place And maybe as those people were running, they were thinking of that. The third one is Hebron, another uh, extant city that's very much in the news. It's not only a city name, but it also, Hebron is the Hebrew word for fellowship. Isn't that interesting? So when you were running to Hebron, you were running to the place of fellowship. The fourth city, Bezer, is not only a city name, but Bezer means stronghold or fortress. It's the place of security, a stronghold place, a fortress place. The fifth one, Ramath, uh, uh, or Ramat, which is very common nowadays, Ramat this, Ramat that. It, it means the high place, Ramat, or the heights, or exalted. But, but it's, it's a heights, a high place, or an exalted place. And so he says, I want you to go to Kadesh, the holy place. I want you to go to... to Shechem, the shoulder. I want you to go to Hebron, the fellowship place. I want you to go to Bezer, the stronghold or the fortress. Fifthly, uh, Ramoth, uh, exalted or heights, run there. Or the last one, number six, Golan, which is not only a city name, but it means separated. Golan, separated. There's still a, a division of the Hebrew or the Jewish army called the Golani Brigade, which is their ultra, ultra uh, prepared kind of commando types that, that are the Golanis. They're the separated. They're, they're separated out as they look through the Israeli army and they look for the best of the best and they Golani them out and separate them. And so when this final city of refuge was spoken of, it spoke of being separated. So Golan, separated, uh, Ramoth, uh, exalted or heights, Bezer, stronghold or fortress, Hebron, fellowship, Shechem, shoulder, and Kadesh, holy place or righteousness. And you know, what's interesting, I, I wrote these right into my Bible, and I thought about, in verse 7, so they appointed Kadesh, and I wrote holy place, and I thought, who would want to go to a holy place? Someone who felt unholy or someone who felt unclean. And then I looked at, at Shechem, who would want to go to the shoulder place well someone who felt either weary or frightened that's when my children come to my shoulder when they can't walk anymore like at disney world or something they just come and you know or the holy land trips they always come and fall asleep on my shoulder and you have to lug them around and it's a joy and that's why you would run to shechem uh and on and on i could go through all of them if you went to each of these it's because you you would think of the implication of what you would get there if you were going there for refuge well I want you to listen now to how each of these city names portray details of the refuge. Now remember, this all starts with the writer of Hebrews takes the word for refuge, for these cities of refuge, and he plops it right down there in Hebrews 6, and he says that Jesus Christ is the refuge we flee to. Now isn't it interesting that there are six facets, six cities God named. God picked the Hebrew names for each of these cities. There are thousands of cities. He picked these six. He picked these six words. And he picked the six meanings that they would encompass. And that's what Paul meant about the types, the things that speak in the Old Testament reflecting what we see in the New Testament about Jesus Christ. So how do these detail the refuge Christ offers to us to lay hold of every day, every hour, 
in every moment of our lives. We'll think of it this way. Christ is the closest, the safest, and the only refuge for the unclean. And so if you were going to run off, first of all, to Kadesh, you ran to a holy place or righteous place because you were unclean, because you were guilty, uh, or at least people thought you were guilty in the Old Testament context in these cities of doing something that was murderous. But for us today... Jesus Christ is the closest, the safest, and the only refuge for the unclean. Why? Because he's the only one that can clean us. The world can give us turning over new leaves and new resolves, and we can get into some program, and we can program ourselves to respond differently. But if there's no divine internal change, we revert back. We're reading as a family the, the biography of George Mueller. He was a real rascal. He was a lying, cheating, drinking, carousing, uh, just deceitful young man in seminary, no less, going to become a pastor. And, And he would try his hardest, and he'd make it one week, he'd make it two weeks, he'd make it one day, two days with his resolves in the early 1800s. But he never was able to make it because he found, after he was saved, that he had never gotten a new heart. He was never made clean. He was an unclean person putting on exterior trappings of clean or cleanliness. So Christ is the closest, safest, and only refuge for the unclean. Secondly, Christ is the closest, safest, and only refuge for the weary. Thirdly, Christ is the closest and safest and only refuge for the homeless. Uh, And by the way, what is a homeless person? It doesn't mean they don't have a house. We have many homeless people in America that have houses. A home is when you're surrounded by people that you trust and love, and you can relax around those you love and trust. Many people live in houses. They don't have a home. And there's a restlessness. We have a lot more homeless in America than the 600,000 they say we have. We have millions of homeless people. They never rest. They never trust. They never are able to relax around those they love. They are truly homeless and they feel lonely they feel isolated they feel detached and jesus said i am the closest the safest and the only refuge for you when you feel homeless he is also the closest and safest and only refuge for the helpless we come to times in our life when we feel helpless when there's nothing else we can do he said i'm your refuge he's also the closest and safest and only refuge for us when we feel hopeless when we come to the place where we don't have hope that anything's going to change. He says, I'm the one that you flee to. And finally, he's the refuge for us when we are tempted. The question is, have you fled to the safest spot in the universe, to Jesus Christ? In other words, have you been saved? And if so, are you experiencing all that he wants to offer in that refuge? Because if you look around, Christ wants to be your moment-by-moment perfect refuge. Turn with me now to the New Testament. I want you to look at 1 Corinthians 10, and this is going to be the beginning of targeting uh, scriptures in the New Testament for you to find Christ as the perfect, perfect refuge. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 11. This is uh, a, a wonderful, wonderful reminder from the Apostle Paul. He wrote to the Corinthians, who, by the way, the Corinthians were secular and pagan and mostly Gentile, and and he's writing to them, introducing them to what he spent his time studying, the Hebrew Old Testament, the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Scriptures. And this is what he says after chronicling for ten verses some of the most amazing stories of the Old Testament. He just whips through them. Uh, And and if you notice, he talks about in verse 1, Exodus 14, the Exodus event. He talks about in uh, verse 3, the manna in Exodus 16. He talks in verse 4 of chapter 10 of 1 Corinthians about the water from the rock. That's Exodus 17. Then in verse 6, he talks about uh, the, the lusting after stuff in the wilderness. That's Numbers 11. And then, verse 8, he talks about the whole uh, golden calf deal in Exodus 32. Uh, Then he talks about the serpent deal in in Numbers 25, in verse 9. And then he talks in verse 10 about Numbers 21, the murmuring, and the destroyer that came in Numbers 14 at the other half of the verse. So, I mean, he references 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 different Old Testament stories in as many verses. Just like he just rattles those stories off like that. And then look what he says in verse 11 after that incredible uh, just just archive or, or, or just referencing these stories. He says in verse 11, Now all these things 
these Old Testament accounts, all these Old Testament kind of hard to understand stories, those happen to them, the Jewish people, as examples. And they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the age have come. He said God could have picked out of the millions and billions of different events of the Old Testament world, all the pre-Christ world before his advent. He says he could have picked any of them, but he picked the stories that are contained in those 39 Old Testament books as examples. As in the word examples is the Greek word tupas. And that's what we call in Bible study types. And the cities of refuge are just one example of a picture or a type of Jesus Christ. A picture. In fact, if you ever get, and and this is something to think about, if you ever are reading through the Old Testament and you're really bored and you can't figure out why on earth that is in there, put Christ right in the middle of it. And you know what? You'll find most often that, that a lot of those very hard to understand stories, if you see how they reflect on Jesus Christ, all of a sudden you'll understand why God included one of those hard stories. So millions of things could have been recorded, but God chose to record only those things that are in the Old Testament because they enable us to grow in our understanding of him and how to have a relationship with him. So because of that, keep going to the right to Hebrews chapter 6. And I want to show you a type. Hebrews chapter 6, where we've been for the last couple, three weeks. Hebrews 6, and look again at the precious words of what verse 18 says. It says that we have fled, verse 18, for a refuge. We have fled for refuge. How do we do that? How do we flee for refuge? Well, Jesus Christ, our hope, our refuge, and our salvation We saw this morning, it's just one thought away, one prayer away. He's the closest spot of security in the universe. And when we flee to him, we find that his arms are open. We find that he's waiting for us 24-7. It's not just when you get saved that his door is never locked. It's not just when you come to salvation that you find that he's easy to find and easy to access. It's all the way through life. You know, the scriptures say, as you received Christ, so walk in him. As you received him, his arms open to all, his his doors never locked, the completely sufficient refuge, the only hope. It's so wonderful. But as you received him, walk through life, knowing him in that same way. Jesus is so much better than these earthly cities of refuge because he died for us who are guilty. And not only were we guilty when we got saved, but we are continuing to be guilty of sin. Because all of us sin even after we're saved. And if we say we have no sin, we're liars and we deceive ourselves. No one this side of heaven is perfect or eradicated or sinless. And so Jesus is our perfect refuge because he's the one who died and wants to cleanse the guilty ones. And he is the one who is permanent. He says, once you come to me, I'll never leave you or forsake you, and I'll never push you out, and I'll never say you're, you're just too much and you've sinned one too many times, and, and I'm through with you, and he'll toss us out. He never does that. He saves us to the uttermost. Well, let me go through. Christ is our closest and safest and only refuge. And I want to go through each one of these names. And you might want to take some notes here. Kadesh, first of all, means he's the holy place or righteousness. And that's the first need we have. When we come to Christ, we find the first thing he gives us when we flee to him is his righteousness. Now, a verse to write down is 2 Corinthians 5.21. And it says, but of him are you in Christ Jesus who... I mean, that's, that's 1 Corinthians 1.30. 5.21, he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that's Jesus, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He clothes us with righteousness. Now, Paul says, the other verse I was quoting is 1 Corinthians 1.30. He becomes our lifelong source of righteousness. But the instant of our salvation, 2 Corinthians 5.21 says that Jesus Christ puts his righteousness on us and our sin goes on him. So the first thing we see when we flee to Christ is that he is the refuge for the unclean. The holiness of the Lord Jesus Christ is the only hope we have as sinners. He is our refuge when we run to him as sinful and unclean. But it doesn't end the instant of our salvation. It's lifelong. 
Because we continue to be unclean throughout life. That's why the scriptures tell us that the the finished work of Christ on the accursed tree affords us a hiding place. Not only once and for all initially, but moment by moment through life. Why? Because what Satan's ministry, if you can say the devil can have a ministry, his ministry is accusing us, pointing out when we sin, trying to make us discouraged and deceited because he says, look at what your, your Christian's doing now. And he, he points out and accuses us. He is the accuser of the brethren. That's why we should be careful not to be. You know, Christians are the only army that shoots their, their fallen comrades. They're wounded. They, they, we shoot them. Uh, we, don't, we don't take them to the hospital and help them get better. We shoot them. We, we injure them further when they're down. And we're supposed to rather be running them to the holy place, to the refuge for the unclean. There are many hymns about this, old hymns. I'll quote a couple. To that blessed fountain of thy blood, incarnate God, I fly. Let me wash my spotted soul from crimes of deepest dye. And that is not only at the instant of salvation, but all through life. If we are constantly characterized, 1 John 1, 9 says, by confessing our sins, present active indicative, an ongoing process, a Christian is confessing, he is faithful and just, eris tense, to have already forgiven us. What's our responsibility? Fleeing to him, to the place of where he cleans off the unclean. What's his place? He has already forgiven us. It's not how hard we confess. It's not how earnestly we ask for his cleansing. It's not using the right words. It's fleeing to the refuge for the unclean. And he says, I cleanse you because I've already forgiven you of all of your sins. What a blessing that is. Jesus is the refuge for the unclean. There's no sin he can't forgive. There's no stain he can't remove. There's no failure he can't forget, even though we remember them. And therefore, we should remember this week these words from Christ's lips. Now, this is where I want you to turn. Look at Mark chapter 1 and verse 40. And when you think of this refuge for the unclean, I want you to hear what Jesus says, okay? Because he's saying this to you and me today in our lives, no matter where we are. And it's something that that is precious to hold on to when you're struggling, especially with sin. Verse 40, now... Verse 40 says, a leper came to him. And by the way, Luke, when he records this, remember Luke was a what? A doctor. And when Luke records this in Luke 5, 12, he adds one word. It says, now a leper came to him. Do you know what what Luke adds? A leper full of leprosy. He he wasn't just a, a little leper. He didn't just have one spot here or there on his face or breaking out. He was covered with sores. And so Luke, you know, medically tells us this was really a bad case. Came to him, imploring him, and kneeling down to him, and saying, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And that's what we come to, to this refuge for the unclean. And what does Jesus say? He says, well, if you straighten up your life, uh, if you really promise me, you know, you're going to not mess up again. You know, it's kind of like, you know, I'm not sure I, I'm going to bail you out this time. No, no, look what he says in verse 41. Then Jesus moved with compassion, hmm. stretched out his hand and touched him. He, didn't, he could have uh, just spoken a word. He could have just glanced at him. He could have blinked. He could have done anything. But he is so relating to this uncleanness. It's a picture, too. Everything Jesus did was intentional. And his picture was that he became sin. He identified. We, he took our sin on himself. If you touched a leper, you were, you were yourself unclean. You were defiled. And Jesus said, I am defiled for you. I will take your defilement on myself. So he touched him. And look at his words, though. Even better than the object lesson. He said, I am willing be cleansed. So this week... When you feel unclean, find Jesus as the refuge for the unclean. And remember the words from his lips right there in verse 41. I am willing. Be cleansed. And what can Jesus cleanse us from? Mark 3 tells us, verse 28, all unrighteousness. All. There is no sin he can't forgive. In the horriblest verse in the Bible about the the unpardonable sin, 
Jesus said, all sins are forgivable. All. Sometimes we think we have the one sin that is unforgivable. No, flee to the refuge for the unclean. Secondly, if you're taking notes, Shechem means shoulder, and it suggests we find in Christ a resting place, a friend upon whom we can lay our burdens, lay our heads, lay our weary bodies. We think sometimes, can I hold out? That's what new believers always ask. And the answer right back from Christ is, I'll hold you. You don't have to hold out. I'm the one that's holding you. Don't you, parents, remember the days when your children finally realized it was you holding them? They get up on your shoulders and they hold on for dear life until finally they realize that it's not how tight they hold you, but how secure is your grip on them. And they finally, you can feel their body relax when they trust you. And that's what God wants us to come to when we flee to him. Here he is as the refuge for the weary in that refuge city called Shechem. And it's the Lord Jesus Christ as our strong Savior. And most of us have found that we can find no rest ruling ourselves. Uh, That was what was so neat to hear in the Cosgrove testimonies, especially Linda's. When she was ruling her life, she didn't have any rest. When you and I rule our lives, we don't have rest. We who are weary find rest in him when we give up trying to run our lives our way and make our little worlds ordered the way we want them. The Lord sometimes disorders our world so that we can only find rest in him. And finding rest in him is when by faith we lean not only on his merit but on his almighty power. As a child who is tired finds refuge on the shoulders of their loving father and mother, so the Lord Jesus Christ says, I want to bear your burdens. I want you to come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. Do you hear those words coming out of his mouth? Do you hear him talking about the city of refuge, the city of the shoulder. And when he introduced himself, and let's turn there the, back to, to Matthew 11 and verses 28 to 30. I want you to think of Jesus Christ who fulfilled all scripture. He says, it's my purpose to fulfill all scripture. And so one of the, the great cities of refuge was the city of refuge, which was Kadesh for the unclean. And Jesus says, I'm willing, I'll cleanse you, come to me. And the second great city of refuge is the refuge called the shoulder city that they were to run to. And this is what Jesus said. And this week, when you find yourself weary, find Jesus as the refuge for the weary. There's no sheep of his pasture. He doesn't invite to find rest in him. He seeks us, he finds us, and he offers his perfect rest. And this week, as you're weary, remember these words that came right from Christ's lips. Matthew 11:28. Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Verse 29, take my yoke upon you, learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Are you weary? Do you think you just can't go on? You just don't have enough strength? You know, the hymn, when we reach the end of our hoarded resources, when our strength is gone, ere the day is half done, when we reach the end, our Father's full giving has only begun. His love has no limit. His grace has no measure. His power has no boundaries known unto men because He's infinite. He gives and gives and gives again. This week... Find Jesus as a refuge for the weary. Real quickly, Hebron means fellowship. It suggests our fellowship with God and our fellowship with other believers. You can have a house but not a home. If you have a home, you'll be at home anywhere, even if you have no house. Home is when you relax in the company of those you love and trust. And Jesus says, you can be at home with me. And what he says is, I am the refuge for those who are alone and feel homeless. In the Old Testament, if you remember Noah's dove... We are just like Noah's dove. Do you remember he opened the window and let the dove out? And it says the dove could find no place to land, and so it came back. And we, apart from him, find no rest and no safety and no fellowship outside the ark. We're homeless wanderers. But when we come to Christ in that ark of refuge, we find perfect fellowship. The Lord Jesus Christ is the only real Hebron for our soul. 
There's no fellowship with the Father except through Him. And truly our fellowship, 1 John 1, 3, is with the Father through Him. And so if you really want to be at home and not alone, in fact, my good friend Jim Berg always says something I, I love to think about. He said, loneliness is when God takes everyone and everything else out of my life so He can be the closest. Now think about that. We're, we're scraping trying to fill our lives with stuff because we don't want to feel alone. And loneliness is when God takes everyone and everything else out of our life so he can be the closest. And he says, I want to be your Hebron. I want to be your fellowship. So this week, Jesus is the refuge for the homeless, for us who, who feel alone. He promised to always be with us. He said, I'll lead you through life. I'll meet you at death. I'll carry you to your tone of home. And I will be your Emmanuel forever. I will be with you. What is heaven? You know, heaven is not, you know, going around and testing if it's really a gold street, you know, if those are really pearls. What is heaven? It's Emmanuel, God with us. So did you know you can actually experience heaven here? The best part of heaven you can experience here. And thou shalt call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. What is that? That's Jesus Christ we flee to. Well, Jesus is the refuge for us who are homeless and lonely. Look at Matthew 28, 20. I want you to hear his words. Matthew 28 and verse 20. Hear the words from the lips of Jesus as he says this at the end of the verse. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age of the earth or of your age, when you, your meter runs out and you die, I am with you to the end. You know what, when I leave the office to go out for an appointment or a luncheon or, or wherever I have to go, I always say to the ladies, are you going to be okay leaving you here all alone? And, and at first they, you know, they kind of wondered, why? Do you think there's a stalker in the building or something? And uh, I would wait for them to say something, and then I'd say, you're not alone. Who's here? The Lord is with you. And when I leave people in the hospital rooms after I pray with them, read with them, I say, you going to be okay all alone? And those that I've met with in the past or that have thought, about this scripture they say I'm not alone why because we learn to flee to Jesus he is the refuge for the homeless he says I am with you always even to the end he is our refuge well I have a, a very short time to do the last three but I'll do them for you because someone told me this morning they can't wait any longer to hear these words so I'll tell you right real quick Bezer means stronghold or fortress it suggests the protection and victory we have in Christ the safest place in the world is in the will of God and Jesus is the refuge for us when we're helpless he's our fortress our stronghold and Jesus is our refuge when we're weak he is strong and when we reach the end of all we are he just has begun Remember this week, and turn back with me to Matthew 14, and I want to show you Jesus at our most helpless moment. He's right there. Matthew 14, verse 27. And I want you to think about this because the, the six verses I'm going to read to you right now, Jesus put him into that situation. And if Jesus is, is at work in your life, he's going to regularly not only put you in lonely positions so he can be closest, he's going to put you in helpless positions so you cry out to him for refuge to help you now watch what it says in verse 27 immediately jesus spoke to them and said be of good cheer it's i don't be afraid remember they're out in the storm and, and he's walking on the sea and peter said lord if it's you command me to come to you on the water and he said come verse 29 and when peter had come down out of the boat he walked on the water to go to jesus wow as long as you are listening and obeying the lord you and i can walk on water not not the water of the sea of galilee although they are starting a new now in the Sea of Galilee, they actually have, for some groups, a walking on water place. They've actually put a plate of glass, and they let people get out of the boat and walk a little distance on the water. It's, it, it, literally, it's, it's one of the gimmicks they're trying to do people to walk on water. I'm not talking about fake walking on water. He really did walk on water. But look at this. Verse 30, when he saw the wind was boisterous, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Now look at this. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said, Oh, you of little faith, why do you doubt? Did you know all sin comes back in the very basic essence to a lack of faith? 
Think about it. If you're anxious and sinning and anxiety, you don't trust the Lord. If you're angry, you don't trust that the Lord can solve the situation. If you are lustful, you don't think the Lord can satisfy your needs. If you and I are, are whatever we are in life, if we're ungrateful, if we're, we're just angry, if we're anxious, whatever it is, it's a lack of faith. That's when we're helpless. And we're supposed to flee to the refuge. And look what he says. Oh, you of little faith, why do you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those who were in the boat came and worshipped him and said, Truly, you're the Son of God. What happens when we flee to the refuge for the helpless? We find he's the Son of God. He is able to help us in our time of need. Ramoth, exalted or heights, reminds us we're seated with Christ. He's a refuge for the hopeless. That's what Ramoth reminds us. He is the heights. He is the, the one who gives us a purpose and a hope. It's not us pulling ourselves up or, or convincing ourselves or, or positive thinking. It's us coming to him as the exalted one, the heights. He's a refuge for us when we're hopeless. By nature, we are not only without strength but without hope, Paul said in Ephesians 2.12. And if we hope in the world system, in politics or religion, we'll have no hope. But Jesus is our hope. He's exalted at the Father's right name. He has a name that's above every name. He is high and lifted up, and he is our Ramoth. And when we're downcast and feeling hopeless in this world, we look up. Remember in the ark? Many months ago we were going through the ark. Remember there was only one window in the ark? God says, put a window above. Why? Why? Because salvation has a different view for us. We don't look out or down or at the storm. We look up. And that's what he is. He's the exalted one. And as long as we keep our eyes on him, we can't be hopeless. Lamentations 3, I call to mind God. And that's what gives me hope. So Jesus is the refuge for the hopeless. When life is dark, when no hope is sight, when we don't know where to turn, Jesus reminds us that there's no answer to all our problems apart from him. And as the song says, when answers aren't enough, what is there always? There's Jesus. He's the one. Uh, Mark chapter 2, if you want to sometime turn there, verses 3 through 5, that paralytic. Uh, when, when that paralytic had no other place for hope, they let him down in front of Jesus. And that's what we need. When you get to a hopeless time in your life, just imagine yourself being let down in the dark and through the dust and through the rooftop crumbling around you and plopping down. And when you open your eyes, look up. And that's all that paralytic did is he looked up into the face of Jesus and he found hope. Mark 2 in verses 3 to 5. And finally, Golan means separated. God has appointed his son to be a refuge for us when we're tempted. We're usually tempted much by the world when we tamper much with the world. And if we have not fled to the Lord Jesus Christ as our city of separation, then we will be often tempted. Jesus says, I want you to come apart to me. I want you to love not the world or the things in the world. That's a lifelong call to us. He's saying, come out, come away, don't love it. You can be in it, but you shouldn't be of it. You can be in it, but you shouldn't love it. You should not be friends with the world system. You can be friends with worldlings and, and point them to Christ. But the system should make you uncomfortable. It's interesting. Golan is the last of the six cities which are mentioned. And most of us would have to confess that separation from worldly ambition, worldly pleasures, and worldly fame is about the last thing we come to in our Christian lives. The words of Jesus... Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. One last verse, and we're going to be done. Look at John chapter 8. Because when we are tempted, and when we do love the world, and when we do fail, I want you to always remember these words of Jesus. Because Jesus is the ultimate refuge for the tempted. He's the ultimate place when we're tempted, and we succumb, and we give in to sin. And what happens immediately is two powerful events take place when we're tempted in sin satan starts accusing us and jesus starts comforting and assuring us and look what he says in john 8 verse 11 i'll start in verse 10 because jesus is the refuge for us who are tempted jesus knows our frame that we are dust he's acquainted with all of our struggles and weaknesses and remember this week these words from christ's lips when you're tempted when Jesus had raised himself up, 
John 8.10. He saw no one but the woman. And he said to her, Woman, where are your accusers? Has no one condemned you? And she said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. You know, every time we're tempted, every time we fall, Jesus stoops down and says, I don't condemn you, Romans 8, 1. There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ. Get up, and in my power, go and sin no more. What that means is turn from that sin, seek his grace, and walk in the Spirit, and we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Let's walk that way this week. Let's stand together and ask the Lord to apply his wonderful cities of refuge to our hearts and lives. Father, I pray that when we're unclean, we'd flee to you as our refuge. When we feel homeless, that we would flee to you and find perfect fellowship. When we're helpless and, and have nowhere else to turn in our weakness, that we would find you as our refuge. And when we're hopeless and when we are those who are, are so struggling, Lord, with temptation and sin, when we just can't find any reason to go on, I pray that we would find you as our perfect refuge. You, O oh Christ, are all in all to us. We thank you for that. Thank you for being our perfect refuge. May we flee there, whatever we face this week. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. God bless you as you go.